Okay, so without further ado, let's start uh, our session. So we will have a first talk by William regarding the precise W measurements at the LATB. Hello, William. Hi, I'm muted. Sorry, let me just share my screen. Um, let me share desktop. Can you see my slides? We can see your slides and hear well Perfect, well. fantastic. And I see that sunlight is causing problems with my video, so I will stop my video anyway. Um, awesome, okie dokie, uh, I need to move that. Okie dokie, let's get started. So today I'm talking about the measurement of the W boson mass at LHCB. Um, so this is a talk on just one publication. Uh, the publication is here. It's available at the links I've put on the uh, slides, which you can click through. Um, there's additional information at this website. And I'm delighted to say that it's published this week. Um, I made this update to the slides five minutes ago, so that was good fun. Um, the paper builds on a rich history of measurements with electroweak bosons at LHCB. This is a program of research that has lasted over a decade now, where we've previously been probing QCD and now we're using um, the electroweak bosons to probe the fundamental electroweak interactions. Um, but if you want more information on those QCD measurements, then there's a hyperlink at the bottom. Okie dokie, so let's get started. Um, so the W boson mass is at the heart of electroweak theory. Um, at leading order, you can write it down in terms of MW, in terms of the Z boson mass, the fine structure constant, or G Fermi, for example. And then as you go beyond leading order, you get higher order radiative corrections from um, other particles within the standard model. Though, of course, we're also interested in new physics, and um, you can view uh, direct measurement of MW in terms of does it agree with a prediction from MZ, alpha, and G Fermi. And, these higher order effects. And if it doesn't, perhaps this delta also includes potential new physics contributions. And so one question we should be asking is, to what degree can we test for new physics using um, high precision standard model measurements? Well, we consider the rest of electroweak theory, the global electroweak fit, which I show on the right hand side here in green, gives a prediction for the W mass with a seven MeV precision. There are hadron collider measurements already from Atlas, CDF and D0. The best measurements to date achieve 19 MeV precision. Um, combinations are still ongoing, but um, direct measurements tend to average out at the 12, 13 MeV level of precision. And so there's this gap between indirect measurement precision, direct measurement precision. And indeed it could be that new physics is hiding um, in this, this gap. And so improved direct measurements are important. And indeed, in particular, improved measurements of the W mass are crucial because the precision of the direct measurements directly limits the interpretation of the entire global electroweak fit in terms of new physics. Okie dokie. So why LHCB? So this is our detector. Um, on the left hand side is a schematic of our detector. Um, we're a single arm spectrometer instrumented in the forward region. So the proton proton collisions take place inside this yellow box on the left hand side. And um, you can see one of the beam lines runs through the center of our detector and we instrument around the beam line. And on the right hand side, I've just got a very rough guide um, to the relative coverage uh, compared to Atlas and CMS. And so while LHCB is designed for flavor physics, the um, excellent detector performance means we can also act as a general purpose forward detector. We have a small region of overlap between Atlas, CMS and LHCB, and then we have unique precision coverage in the furthest forward region. And this is important and useful um, when we are seeking to measure the W boson mass. Um, the significant forward coverage at LHCB offers a significant advantage. So this plot I take from this paper here um, shows the results you get if you extract the W boson mass from a measurement of lepton PT in W boson decays. And if you do it at Atlas or CMS, you get a spread of values because of imperfect knowledge of the proton internal structure. Um, and at LHCB, you also get a, a spread of values. But crucially, the spreads are anti-correlated the uncertainties are anti-correlated, which means that in any overall LHC-wide average, a measurement from LHCB will significantly cancel uncertainties in the Atlas or CMS measurement and give you a much better overall combination. And of course, it's the overall average that is the quantity that ultimately really does matter the most. So we've set about making this measurement to LHCB. We've chosen to analyze a fraction of our overall data set for the analysis um, first. Um, we're looking the, at the data set um, collected just in 2016. Um, so on the right hand side, I've got this plot of all of our data collected to date, and we're just analyzing the magenta line at the moment. This corresponds to an integrated luminosity of 1.7 inverse open advance. 
And the idea is that this is an initial proof of concept measurement. We can get community feedback, continue to analyze our four run two data set, which is more than three times larger. Um, and incorporate uh, that feedback in our uh, legacy run to measurement. What is our selection? Well, it's, it's quite a simple selection. We have our fiducial acceptance that corresponds to our um, uh, uh, detector coverage. Uh, we base it around a single muon candidate that's responsible for selecting the event in the trigger. This candidate needs to be well reconstructed and isolated and associated with the primary interaction, which lets us reject heavy flavor decays and hadronic backgrounds. We don't want any additional high transverse momentum muon in the event. This lets us reduce uh, backgrounds from Z boson decays. And note that we don't actually have um, or use recoil information. We're not a 4 pi detector, and so we don't have high quality recoil information to include within this analysis. We have a fit window between 28 and 52 GeV in lepton PT, and that corresponds to about 2.4 million events. So what is our analysis strategy? So we look at the lepton PT distribution. Well, technically, we look at the charge of the lepton divided by the PT of the lepton. Um, if I show the right hand side, this has two advantages. First, I can plot the W minus and W plus on the same plot. And secondly, it lets us show the entire high PT lepton tail, because as we go out to zero, um, let the PT lepton, of course, goes up, off to infinity. This plot also shows you the challenges associated with this analysis. I show here a 300 MeV shift in the W boson mass, and this is causing per, per, uh, percent level uh, variations in the distribution. Now we want to uh, you know, target uh, a, a measurement that is an order of magnitude more precise. And so we're really sensitive to per mil level effects. Technically within the analysis, we also simultaneously fit the phi star distribution in Z boson events. Phi star is defined this way. Now, crucially, this variable is determined solely from the final state muon directions. It's defined in terms of delta phi and delta eta between the two muons, which means that there's no momentum information going in or needed to, to calculate the value of phi star. It's just the direction of the muons in the detector, which enables us to somewhat decouple effects associated with our experimental knowledge of um, the momentum, the momentum scale effects, from control of QCD effects. So how do we model electroweak physics? This is the functional form at Born level for electroweak bosons. You've got three degrees of freedom associated with the production of the electroweak boson, its PT, rapidity, and mass. And then you've got two additional degrees of freedom associated with the direction of the decay of the electroweak boson. Now we model the boson production, so these first three degrees of freedom, using matrix element plus parton shower simulation. The central model we use here is Pelheg plus Pythia 8. This is because it provides the best description of the Z boson PT. We also float various parameters associated with QCD modeling um, within our fits. This just enables us to ensure the best description of the QCD physics. And there's a link through here to a detailed um, paper setting out uh, this approach. The angular structure is defined in terms of these angular coefficients, the AI, A0 through to A7. And we model the angular structure of the decay using dy turbo at order alpha s squared. Now, this is a short talk. I cannot possibly talk through the uh, entire details of the analysis. So I'm just going to pick out the key methodological approaches, the systematics. We align the detector and um, consider the momentum scale calibration using JSI Upsilon and Z boson data, following methods included in this paper here. You can see our excellent modeling of the Z-peak just in this uh, distribution on the right-hand side. We have selection efficiencies. These are determined using simulation, and we take um, corrections from our Upsilon and Z-boson data. Backgrounds, our most significant background to the W-boson events comes from hadronic decay in flight. This is determined using a dedicated um, sample of hadrons we um, select directly through the trigger. There are also important theoretical effects we have to consider. Pass on distribution functions, our knowledge of the proton's internal structure. We make the measurement independently for three global PDF sets, and the central result we get out is the arithmetic average of these three sets. And we assume 100% correlation of these sets when we are extracting the overall PDF uncertainty on our um, uh, averaged result between the three sets. In terms of the boson production model, 
we repeat the measurement using different programs to model the W and Z boson production, changing from Pau Hay plus Pythia to Pau Hay plus Herwig or to Herwig 7 at next leading order and so on. And the envelope of final results we get from uh, about five programs sets the systematic uncertainty we apply here. For boson decay, so these are the angular coefficients I was talking about, we vary these according to uncorrelated scale variation following this paper here. Again, it's hyperlinked for those who want to click through. An additional parameter we also float associated with the A3 coefficient. We're particularly sensitive to A3, and this coefficient just compensates for global changes in A3 that occur when we do scale variation that would simply decrease the data model agreement. The analysis is also built around a variety of different cross checks. We do fits using pseudo data, um, to demonstrate that the QCD parameters in our model are sufficient to capture variations when we change the QCD model. So we can take um, our default model, which I said was Pelhe plus Pythia, replace it with DY Turbo or Pelhe plus Herwig or whatever, generate pseudo data, check that we, we haven't changed the value of the W mass, but we can fit with our default model and check how much the W mass value we extract has shifted. And we find that actually we have enough flexibility within our fit within these QCD parameters to capture QCD effects with a minimal bias in the W boson mass. Now, I'm not going to talk through all of the cross checks. There are lots of them. There are 50 50 orthogonal splits in the data which give consistent results. We can change our fit range or model freedom or so on. But a couple I want to pick out we do a W boson like fit of the Z boson mass. And this is consistent for the two muon charges. And it's consistent with the PDG value for the Z boson mass. So we've demonstrated that our methodology works with the Z boson. We can also float the W plus and W minus mass difference. And we find that when we do this, we get a mass difference that is consistent with zero. Again, a, a, a cross check, but an important one. And then there are additional tests, for example, in our uh, parameterization of the proton's internal structure and so on. And this is our fit result. I show the fit on the left hand side. You can see that we get a good chi-square degree of freedom, and we get a statistical uncertainty associated with the fit of 23 MeV. The different uncertainties I set out here on the right-hand side, they're kind of related to what I've already talked through, and I don't have time to address them all in detail. Perhaps worth noting is that we already control the experimental total uncertainty at the level of 10 MeV, and our theory uncertainty is currently at the level of 17 MeV, and we're still the statistical uncertainty is still the largest one. And this is our result. So I show it here on the same plot I showed earlier. You can see that we're bang on the value that comes out of the global electric weak fit. And we um, are, of course, in agreement with the previous measurements as well. And we can ask, what is the impact going forward with this? Now, a full combination at the LHC will take many years, but we can assume that the experimental uncertainties are going to be uncorrelated with ATLAS, which is probably a, a reasonable uh, assumption. And we can consider different assumptions for the correlation of the PDF uncertainties and all the other theory uncertainties. And we can just ask if we make these assumptions, what would the combination yield? And so this plot shows with the color scale, the uncertainties you would get out in such a combination. Now, remember that I started this talk by talking about the negative PDF correlation. So we expect to sit somewhere over here. And you would not expect a full theoretical correlation between Atlas and LHCB. And so you might end up with an average that sits somewhere in about this region here, coming in at around the 16 MeV level, which is the precision of the Tevatron average already. Obviously, the Tevatron average was done with far greater um, input and with far more attention to detail. But I think this shows that even with these first measurements from the LHC, we are able to say something interesting. And of course, we look forward to future um, measurements from CMS from updates from Atlas, and we can see where we can get overall at the LHC. And there are future prospects at LHCB. Now, I mentioned that we've only used a third of our data set so far in run two. If we use our full run two data set, we should be able to achieve a statistical uncertainty on MW of about 10 MeV, with an overall precision at below the 20 MeV level, provided we're able to further constrain theory systematics. Techniques to do this might include a double differential fit. And I put a link to a paper here that um, sets out how this could work. The run three data set is going to let us go further. So on the right hand side, I show the um, uh, plans at LHCB. Now, um, 
going to run three, we've just in, in the process of finishing our, the installation of our first major upgrade. This will increase the proton-proton collision rate by a factor of five, which is going to enable far larger data sets. The statistical uncertainty will drop to a negligible level and in turn um, will enable further constraints on systematic effects. And it's plausible that we could reach an overall precision of order 10 to 15 MeV. This is on a time scale of 2025 and beyond, of course, in terms of when the measurement will be published. But I think it's important to look to the future and have kind of that, that ballpark figure in mind. So just to bring things back together and to conclude, um, I presented the first measurement of the W boson mass at LHCb. W mass measurements provide information on a fundamental parameter of nature, the W boson mass, but they're also providing a key test of the overall standard model consistency and thereby indirectly probing new physics. There's good, there's good reason to make this measurement at LHCb. The acceptance is complementary to that of Atlas and CMS, which means that we get reduced correlation of key uncertainties and LHCb can be expected to play a significant role in an LHC wide average. The precision of the measurement I've presented, now published in JHEP, is 32 MeV. This is just based on a third of our existing data set, and we believe that with improved modeling and larger data sets, we can get below the 20 MeV precision level. Thanks a lot for listening. Thank you very much for this um, excellent overview of the measurement. I open up the uh, floor for questions. Raise your hand. There are no questions? Glad I was so clear. <laughs> and I have a quick question um, regarding the treatment of the PDF. So you just include them um, straight or you kind of profile them also in the field? We don't profile them at all. So this is um, one of the ways that we could, of course, reduce the uncertainty in the future, and it's on our radar. If I go back to our um, overview, we have a total uncertainty of order 30 MeV at the moment, and the PDFs are order 10 MeV. So at the moment, we wouldn't gain that much in the overall precision by profiling them. It's certainly something we're looking at in the future as we need to reduce uncertainties, because as this statistical uncertainty comes down, the other sources, of course, become more and more important. And of course, using the data to constrain these effects in situ is exactly the right way to go if we want to reduce them. But for now, we just um, we don't profile them and we assume that um, you know, we just take them as given. Um, Thanks. When do you expect to have the full uh, run two analyzed? Oh, so we're working on the analysis at the moment. The analysis is ongoing. Um, given that the 2016 was published this week, I think we can be given a little bit of leeway for not having the full run two yet. Um, I would hope, uh, oh, wait, I have to be careful how I say this, don't I, because I don't want to make firm commitments. Um, assuming no showstoppers, um, assuming that our 2017 and 2018 data look broadly similar to our 2016 data, then, you know, I would not expect to have a massively long turnaround time for this kind of uh, um, update. I wouldn't want to put a date on it. I wouldn't expect it necessarily to come in this calendar year. I know we're only in January, but um, one would hope that, you know, a timescale that is um, what I would call the near future, maybe not this year, but maybe be soon in the near, near future is reasonable. I guess only you will probably wait for the full result for the before the combination with the other experiments. I think that makes sense. I think we can do to a certain extent. You want to have these discussions beginning sooner mm -hmm. rather than later because if you can align approaches in certain ways. I mean, let's take an example. We we calibrate using Z, but also the upsilon and the J psi. And one of our uncertainties that comes in is knowledge of the upsilon mass. Um, now, if we we should probably have those discussions where we check that we are aligning our approaches sufficiently between the different experiments, such that propagating the correlations from those kind of assumptions through is relatively trivial. And so having the discussions begin now, as, as they are through various communities, right, is useful because it means that where there are potential choices to be made, we can make sure that we're making the choices that make future work simpler and more robust. Um, but I agree, I think putting the formal effort into a full um, combination um, should, should certainly wait. I also think on a, on, on a slight sociological level, it probably makes sense to, to wait for the CMS result to come out as well, because CMS clearly have a lot to say here. And I think that a full Atlas CMS LHCV combination would be far more powerful as a, 
as, as a first approach than just an Atlas LHCV combination. Thank you. Any last chance for questions? If not, thanks, William, for, for this very nice talk. We move on to Alexander that will give us a report on multiple zone measurements at CMS. Okay, okay. can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you and we can see the slides, so please start. Okay, great. So hello everyone, I'm Alexandre Kimi uh, here on behalf of the CMS collaboration to give you this talk about uh, the multi-boson me measurement in CMS. So uh, what is multi-boson? It's uh, the production of uh, multiple W, Z boson or photons. You can have a uh, different kind of diagrams. Uh, here you have an example of diboson and triboson production on the left and on the right. And in the middle, the electroweak diboson, which is a kind of a special case that we call a vector boson scattering. So why do we want to study this uh, production? Uh, first of all, it's a very good test of the structure of uh, the electroweak theory because the boson couplings uh, have a very big impact on the cross-section and polarization. Also, if we want to extend the standard model, uh, we can do so with a higher dimension uh, effective field theory operators uh, that can take into account the uh, anomalous triple or quartic gauge couplings that uh, could happen. Also, it's a very good probe uh, for the electroweak symmetry breaking uh, when we go to the vector boson scattering uh, sector. Because if we didn't have a Higgs boson, uh, actually the unitarity uh, would be uh, broken with a cross-section uh, diverging. And also a uh, deviation from uh, this uh, electroweak symmetry breaking theory would impact the cross-section and anomalous uh, couplings. On the right, uh, you can see a summary of the state of the art of uh, the values of uh, the couplings uh, dating from uh, last year. Uh, so that should be uh, updated with uh, the new result that we've gotten uh, now. So uh, here is a summary of uh, the different uh, papers that were uh, done uh, during the next year. Uh, but uh, in this talk, uh, I will focus only on five of them that are here uh, in red. Uh, for each one of them, uh, you will be able to click on the link, uh, just not on this page, but uh, on the dedicated one. So we'll focus on a double V boson production, uh, where D can be a W or a Z at uh, 5.02 TeV, the differential measurement of a W plus photon, and on uh, the vector boson scattering side, the, we will have uh, opposite sign uh, WW, semi-leptonic WV, and uh, Z plus lepton uh, production. Uh, before we start uh, looking a bit more in detail uh, to this paper, uh, let's just have a look at the different cross section of uh, this kind of production that we have. You can see that uh, whether for the diboson or triboson production, uh, we have quite big uh, cross section, but for the VBS in particular, uh, we have very low ones. So it's a real challenge to observe them in our accelerators, and uh, we basically couldn't study it before we had the full run to data. So that's why uh, those, uh, those studies are only uh, going out uh, now. So the first one of them is the double V production at 5.02 uh, TeV, uh, which is a low pileup run. Uh, we've uh, expected two pileup uh, uh, as opposed to more than 20 in the usual uh, 13 TeV run. Because uh, this, um, this decay mode has already uh, been measured at uh, 7, 8, and uh, 13 TeV by both ATLAS and CMS, um, but uh, this is the, the first measurement at uh, this uh, center of mass energy. So we have uh, different categories, uh, depending on the decay mode, uh, WW, WZ, or double Z. And uh, when we get uh, everything done, uh, we get results that are consistent with uh, the best prediction that we have, uh, which use uh, next to next leading order for QCD and the uh, next leading order for uh, electroic uh, theory. Uh, the second uh, paper I will talk about uh, right now is uh, a differential cross-section measurement of uh, W gamma. Uh, the the uh, inclusive cross-section has already been measured, but uh, there are many interesting things that can be done uh, with a, a differential measurement uh, of this one. Uh, for example, uh, we know that uh, in this decay mode, there, are, there is an effect that's called radiation amplitude zero, uh, because uh, in the, there are interferences between the leading order diagrams that uh, will make the cross-section vanish in uh, certain places of uh, the phase space, uh, mainly in uh, 
when the eta separation between the lepton and the photon is equal to zero. And uh, this uh, vanishing could be affected by uh, extending standard model prediction, uh, with most of them saying that uh, we wouldn't have that much uh, of, a, of a lack uh, at uh, zero uh, delta eta. So uh, when you do the, the differential cross-section measurement, uh, you can do that on uh, different observables. Uh, here I have shown the plot for delta eta, where you can see that we have a good agreement with the simulation, uh, while fav favoring the one using next to next leading order QCD. Uh, but we still have a, a bit of an excess in the high delta eta region compared to prediction. And when we move on to tighter selection to observe this uh, radiation amplitude zero effect, uh, we see a bigger dip at uh, delta eta equal to zero than in the prediction, uh, which, is, which goes in uh, the opposite direction to what would be predicted in uh, most uh, BSM models. Uh, another point with uh, the W plus photon is that, uh, as you can see on the diagram on the right, uh, it's sensitive to the dimension six anomalous triple uh, gauge uh, coupling. So it allows us to put constraint on the, the C3W uh, operator. But as you can see here on the formula for the total cross section, uh, there is a, an important uh, sigma interference term. But uh, we know that uh, at an energy scale above the, the mass of the W, uh, the standard model and beyond standard model have a different elasticity configuration for the transverse uh, WV. And so that means that the angle inclusive variable uh, are not sensitive to this uh, interference cross section. But um, a technique was developed uh, called interference resurrection technique, uh, which basically uh, consists in uh, going from a, a 1D search uh, in uh, the photon PT to uh, a 2D search uh, by adding the azimuthal angle uh, phi. And this led to an improvement uh, of around 10 times. And so this allowed us to put uh, new constraints on the C3W that are the most stringent uh, that we had yet. And you can see the, the fit plots uh, here on the slides. Now uh, let's go a bit more into the vector boson scattering production side. So as I was saying before, it's a purely electronic process, which has a very unique topology. Uh, we have two very forward jets that are a very big uh, separation in eta and both a, a very important invariant mass. As I was saying before, it's a very raw process and uh, suffers from a high irreducible background, uh, notably from uh, the QCD production of the same uh, of the same uh, decay. Well. And so that's why it has only become accessible now that we have the LHC run two completed, and uh, it often needs sophisticated signal extraction using uh, the machine learning techniques and also data driven background estimation to be sure we control the the most uh, possible our, uh, our data. It's interesting because uh, the longitudinal polarized part of uh, the V boson uh, is connected to the Higgs mechanism. And also we can extend uh, the standard model uh, with dimension eight EFT operators uh, that will stand for uh, anomalous quartic uh, gauge couplings. Also, we can have a different uh, kind of channel, uh, depending on the, the way the, the bo both these will decay. Uh, they can be fully leptonic if both these decay leptonically, semi-leptonic with one decay leptonically and the other hydronically, or fully hydronic. And so now the first paper I will talk about uh, here is the fully, fully leptonic opposite sign WW. Uh, we already have uh, same sign WW, but uh, this is the first time that it has been studied uh, in CMS. And so we have three different uh, final states uh, with electron, electron, muon, muon, or electron, muon, uh, using opposite charge, of course. And the electron, muon is the most interesting one, actually, because uh, it's the one where we can uh, the most reduce uh, one of our main background, which is uh, the Drellian uh, production. Uh, the cut is used in this analysis are the standard VBS one requiring high MJJ and delta eta, and also uh, some missing energy to account for the neutrinos uh, produced uh, in the decay one. So another one of uh, the main backgrounds is uh, the top one, and so uh, BJET Vito was uh, included in, in order to suppress it. For the signal dissemination, as I was saying, it's uh, often need a sophisticated method. And so for the electron mu one channel, uh, they use a deep neural network. Uh, while for the other two categories, uh, they only use the, 
the most discriminating variable, which depends on the where in the phase space uh, we are. Uh, at uh, i mjj and delta eta, it's mjj that's the best variable, but for the rest of the phase space, uh, it's uh, the number of fields. And uh, for the background, it uh, has been estimated in a data-driven way uh, for the main ones, so Drelian, top, and uh, QCD production, uh, with a normalization uh, in bins of uh, MJJ and delta eta. And uh, this led to the first observation uh, with uh, above five sigma significance. And uh, while the, the analysis is a uh, is already at a good significance. The biggest impact uh, there was the background data normalization and uh, the QCD scale. The second result in DBS is the semi-leptonic production of a WV. Uh, so semi-leptonic is an interesting channel because it has a larger cross-section than the fully leptonic one, but a smaller background than the fully hadronic. And so in, in this case, you can have two different uh, topologies, uh, depending if uh, the jets coming from the hadronic decay of the V can be resolved in two jets or only in a one very large uh, boosted jet. Once again, uh, the main backgrounds, which are now W plus jet production and tops, are estimated in a data-driven way. And uh, the signal is extracted uh, with, uh, with deep neural networks. And so we get the, the first evidence uh, for uh, this channel with an observed significance of 4.4 uh, sigma. And uh, we get uh, signal strength that uh, are quite in agreement with uh, the standard model, uh, uh, be that when we use only electroweak signal strength or electroweak and QCD one. And on the right, you can see the simultaneous fits uh, to QCD and electroweak, and you can see that we, we, can't, uh, we can't reject the standard model. Uh, And uh, the last paper I will talk about is uh, the Z plus uh, photon uh, VBS production. So this channel is interesting because we have no photon couplings to the Higgs. So this means that this channel has a sensitivity to the neutral uh, quartic gauge coupling, be it anomalous or normal, and also to the triple gauge coupling. But uh, this one is better studied in multi bosons, so it's not the focus of uh, this paper. Here, the main backgrounds are the QCD production, which is uh, estimated from Monte Carlo and that constrained during the simultaneous fit, and also the non-prompt photons, uh, which are estimated in a data-driven way with the photon shape fit. And then the signal is extracted uh, with MJJ and uh, delta eta, which are the, the most, uh, most interesting parameters here. And that way, we can get uh, the cross-section uh, for uh, in, in a differential way for different uh, observables, uh, like the PT of different objects and uh, MJJ. And uh, all of them yield uh, generic good agreements between the data and the precision and the prediction. Sorry. And so for the results, we get uh, a first observation at uh, lots more than uh, five standard deviation. And uh, with uh, perception that uh, are in agreement uh, with uh, the, the theory one, uh, even if uh, a, a little bit of tension can be found uh, for uh, the black like, one. And also, as I was saying, uh, we can study the uh, anomalous quartic gate coupling, and that was done with uh, a measure of the invariant mass of uh, the Z and photon. And uh, this uh, landed us the most stringent limits to date on uh, one of the dimension eight operators, which is called T9, but also very competitive constraints on a lot of other operators, uh, which are called uh, M022, and uh, a lot of the T operators. So to conclude a bit uh, about that, uh, you can see that uh, it's a very active field uh, and there were a lot of uh, new results in uh, 2021 uh, using the full run two data. We've measured cross-section that generally agree well with prediction and that allow us to put uh, new constraints on uh, new physics with uh, several uh, effective field theory operators. But uh, there are still many more results to come uh, with several analyses still underway. And, uh, we, we know that uh, the statistics are the limiting factor for most of these uh, multi-boson results. So we really expect that uh, RAND3 will be able to improve them and uh, even more when we go to uh, the high luminosity LHC uh, in a few years. And that's it from me. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for a nice talk.
Um, are there questions to Alexander? Alexandra, uh, maybe, can you hear me? Yes. I yeah. Yes. I just wanted to ask about uh, the, the full electronic VBS uh, WW uh, uh, process. I just wonder what is the contribution, you know, from Higgs to WW here? Um, Do you separate that, you know, just I want to do roughly some idea uh, how big is the effect yeah the, the effect is quite small uh, for the higgs but uh, i can't tell you uh, more in detail uh, maybe you can find more in, in uh, indication on uh, the pas uh, the paper is not published yet but, okay uh, okay i can take a look at that thanks yeah sorry philip has a question Hello. Yes, I also have a question on the leptonic uh, WW. Um, I was wondering if you can comment on how important the same flavor channels are. So uh, what do you mean by important? Uh, yeah, so you have the you do the measurements in the same flavor in the different flavor channels. And yeah, I was just trying to get a feeling what the contribution for to the significance are from the same flavor channels. Uh, I'm not no. I'm not sure I understand exactly what you mean, but uh, let's know that the the same sign was easier to to measure, so we have a bigger significance uh, sorry. On, uh, on it. No, I mean I mean the same flavor. Ah, okay, okay. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, yeah. So, sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, I think it's. Uh, around 10 percent for both uh, same flavor uh, final states and the way the rest uh, is from the uh, different flavors uh, action mu okay thanks but uh, yeah uh, i'm not uh, quite sure of uh, of the numbers <laughs> it will be better too that already gives me an idea yes <laughs> but yeah they're almost as important but uh, we have a harder time reducing one of the main backgrounds with them so uh, it's uh, it's lacking in this way We have time for another question, if there is. Maybe I have a quick question on the red. Okay, uh, on the radiation zero, the slide seven. Um, I mean, in, in this analysis, you are using this new five variable, but um, are you also explicitly exploiting um, this region where you, um, you know, cut stronger and uh, to place the limits on the BSM? Yes, uh, yes. Uh, as you as you see, uh, without the this tighter selection, you have the plot on the left, and uh, when you go to tighter cuts, uh, you get uh, the plot on the right, which is easier to to exploit. But uh, it was not quite the focus of the paper because uh, yes, uh, it gives us uh, some access to BSM models, but uh, less than the, the second part, uh, which is uh, the interference resurrection technique. I see. So you. The, the, the latter one is actually what uh, is driving the sensitivity of the extracted limits. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any last chance? There doesn't seem to be any other questions. So thanks a lot, Alexander. Thank you. It was a very constructive uh, talk. And we move on with the similar discussion of multi boson production. Um, including vector boson scattering at Atlas by Junji. Uh, can you see the slides I shared? We can see the slides. They are not full screen yet. Uh, oh, yeah, it's not a full screen. Yes. Okay, how about Perfect. now? Perfect. Okay, thank you very much. So I will just talk about the corresponding measurements about the multi boson production, including vector boson scattering from the ATLAS experiment. So Alexandra already gave a nice introduction about why we wanted to study this process. So I just wanted, I will just go very quickly. So, you know, I will not discuss about the di uh, Feynman diagrams, but I wanted to say that, uh, you know, these studies are very important to test standard model predictions for gauge boson self interactions, you know, including triple gauge couplings and quadriga gauge couplings. 
VBS processes are also very important for us to gain a better understanding of, of the dynamics of electroweak symmetry breaking and uh, allow us to test higher order QCD and the electroweak corrections. And uh, we also look for deviations from standard model predictions and search for uh, new physics. So I will first talk about uh, the WW plus at least one jet analysis. As you know that for WW analysis, we often use B veto and also jet veto. And these two selection criteria are very important to suppress the TT bar background, for example. So however, jet veto introduce jet energy scale uncertainties that are often large than lepton related uncertainties. Also, these uncertainties increase for stringer veto cuts applied. And the jet veto is also theoretically challenging. So Atlas decided to look at the WW plus at least one jet and do measurement and compare with the theoretical predictions. And uh, to reduce the Z plus jet background, the opposite side, uh, uh, different flavor channel, you know, the EMU channel is used. And we require at least one, one jet with PT greater than 30 GeV. To suppress TD bar background, B veto cut is, is applied. And we developed a new method to use events with exactly two B jets, with exactly one B jet, and use them to really estimate the TD bar background in the signal region with zero B jet. You know, I just wanted to point out that even in this zero B jet region, the TD bar background is still a factor of two larger than the signal region uh, events. So here uh, we 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 did the measurement, and uh, the the measurement are showing here with this uncertainty here, and uh, overall there is a ten percent uncertainty on the inclusive cross section measurement, and uh, main contribution coming from the jet calibration, the modeling of TD bar background, and also the fake background. And uh, here I also show you calculations. Uh, from uh, several calculations. And you can see that the similar uncertainties on the also uh, around 10% or, or even larger on the predicted cross sections. And here I just show you uh, some details about uh, the calculations, uh, order of calculations that are used. So we also perform the differential cross section measurements for the inclusive fiducial region and also two regions with leading jet PT greater than 200 GeV and leading lepton PT greater than 200 GeV. And we, we, we did the differential measurement for 12 variables. And here just to show you for the inclusive region leading lepton PT compared with the different calculations. And you can see that overall a good agreement observed. We also look at the EMU invariant mass distribution. And uh, we also use uh, this distribution to uh, constrain the CW parameter, which is a parameter that is used to indicate the effects of effective field theory. Uh, uh, sorry, I should say <laughs> effect of new physics in the effective field theory framework. Uh, the second analysis I'm going to talk about is the TriW observation. And uh, here are the Feynman diagrams that are considered. And uh, I wanted to point out that uh, uh, for this analysis, uh, we have the Higgs production WH and the W decay to one on, on shell W boson and one off shell W boson. And uh, this contribution is also included at a part of the signal. So there are two decay channels considered two lepton channel where two same sign W decay leptonically to electron or muon and the other one decay hydronically. And the other one is the three lepton channel where all three lepton, three W bosons decay leptonically. To, to reduce the WZ background, we, we required no same flavor opposite sign lepton pair in the final state. So here just to show you the, the event yield in the final signal region, you can see that as a dominant background coming from the WZ process. To constrain the WZ 
normalization. We, we divide the WZ events into three control regions with zero jet, one jet, and at least, at least two jets. And we use these events to con constrain the normalization of WZ plus N jet process. And the charge flip background photon conversion non prompt backgrounds are determined by data driven uh, techniques. To further constrain, uh, to further separate uh, the background, uh, we, we used uh, the boost decision tree. And this table shows the variables, you know, 12 and, and 11 variables that are used uh, to, to train BDD. And then after that, you know, we use the BDT distribution in these uh, four signal regions and uh, the trilepton tri invariant mass for the WZ process to perform simultaneous feed to extract the signal strains. So here, just to show you the BDT distributions and the yellow area indicates the signal contribution. And you can see that uh, the dominant uh, contributions uh, sensitivity coming from the E mu, 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 and uh, three lepton channels, their sensitivities are very similar. And we also check uh, various kinematic distributions for the two lepton channel and the three lepton channel. And uh, overall, we found a good agreement between data and the simulation. So this gives us the first observation of tri-W production with a significance of 8.2 sigma. And this table show you the observed expected significance as well as the signal strains for different channels and also for the combined for all channels combined. So the measured cross section is listed here and the systematic uncertainty is dominated by non-prompt background and prompt background modeling. And we also have you know, the latest high order calculations for the cross section for these channels. And the total cross section is about 505 in uh, 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 sorry, fem, femdava. And currently, there is about a 2.5 sigma uh, tension between the measured and the predicted cross sections. And there are various checks performed, and no problems found uh, for the data analysis. So we still need to remain to see you know, what is the reason for the, for the tension. The third analysis I'm going to talk about is the gamma VBS process, where Z decay leptolinkate to electron or muons. And here are the selection criteria used. You know, we select the leptons, we select the photon, and uh, we, we also select the cost to, to get the VBS enriched region. To get rid of Z plus Js, the photon initial state radiation and the final state radiation, we require the dilepton mass and the dilepton photon mass, the sum should be greater than two times the, the Z mass. And uh, to, to get rid of the QCD, the gamma jet jet contribution, we define a wearable zeta here, kind of reflect the lab, uh, photon centrality. And uh, we, we define events with this zeta wearable less than 0.4 as the signal region greater than 0.4 as the QCD control region. And here, I just to show you the photon ET distribution for the QCD control region and for the rapidity difference between the two jets for the signal region. And you can clearly see the signal contribution here. After that, we use the MJJ distribution in uh, signal region and the QCD control region. We perform a simultaneous feed to find the signal strength. And you can see that the signal contribution here and also dominant QCD background also in the, the signal region. So here I just show you the measured cross-section for the electroweak production and also for the combined electroweak and the QCD production. The systematic uncertainties are dominated by the jet uncertainties and also electroweak and QCD modeling of the gamma JJ processes. Uh, the, the fourth analysis is still the gamma VBS, but where the Z decay, lepto, uh, uh, decay to neutrinos resulting high missing energy in the final state. And here I just show you, you know, we also cut on the jazz. We cut on missing energy due to the two neutrinos. 
we cut on the, the lepton, uh, on the photon. And then we, we require zero lepton uh, for the signal region. And we also defined, uh, uh, we also invert one or two selection costs uh, to define control regions you know, in order to check the background modeling, which mainly coming from the QCD, W gamma JJ and Z gamma JJ processes. Uh, one of the important uh, uh, variables that we used is the photon centrality variable, which is defined here. It has a slightly different definition than the one used for the um, uh, le 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 lepton channel. And this variable is one when the photon is in the middle between the two tagging jets and it is zero uh, when, when it's further forward in eta than the two jets. So here, just to show you the photon centrality distribution, you can see that it can be a very powerful variable to distinguish between the signal and, and the background. And then after that, we perform the simultaneous feed to the MJJ distribution using four signal region beams and also the 16 control, control region beams. And here, just to show you the comparison between data and the predictions. And overall, we see good agreement. And uh, you know, here, just to show you the, the scale factors you know, used for the signal process and also for the two dominant QCD, Z gamma JJ and the W gamma JJ processes. And the scale factors are also found consistent with one. And we measured the Z gamma uh, process, electroweak production with 5.2 sigma. And here you can see the, the signal contribution with this light yellow uh, area. And uh, the, the also we measured the, the cross-section uh, are listed here. The last analysis I'm talking about is, uh, is uh, the first attempt of a combined EFT interpretation uh, for four atlas electroweak analysis. So these are basically WW, WZ, and also ZZ, uh, plus this uh, ZJJ production via this vector boson fusion. So the framework we used is the standard model e uh, electroweak field theory. And uh, we only considered uh, the uh, dimension six operators here, you know, using the WASA basis. And if you can calculate the cross-section and you will find a contribution from, from the linear term and also from the quadratic and the cross term in, in terms of the Wilson coefficients. And uh, uh, we, you know, in principle, we can also have a EFT dimension eight operators, which will have contribution that are same order as these quadratic and the cross terms. However, in our model, we didn't consider dimension eight operators. And uh, we, we reported limits based on linear and uh, quadratic fees. And uh, the difference kind of will give some idea about the size of missing these uh, dimension eight operators. So here, just to show you uh, two examples of the, the, the combined feed. And the dashed lines indicate the constraints you know, from each individual analysis and the solid uh, line indicates the combined uh, uh, constraint. And you can see that uh, beta constraints are obtained from the combined analysis. And we also set the limits on this, uh, you know, we didn't set on the, all the 33 uh, parameters. We, we rather set limits on the 15 linear combinations of these WASA basis coefficients. And we did it for the each individual channel, and we also did it for the combined profile fees. And we also look at the, the linear fit and also linear plus quadratic fees. And these two plus just to show you, you know, the results that uh, obtained from the fit. Here is my conclusion slide. And uh, you know, I, I mentioned that a multi boson and a VBS processes are interesting uh, processes to test standard model predictions and also to search for new physics. For di bosons, you know, we we can do very precise measurement. We also can study boson polarization. 
for VBS, you know, we, we already observed all the VBS processes. And now we move to differential cross-section measurements and also polarization measurements. For triboson, you know, we still aim to, to figure out, to, to, to observe all channels. And I also showed you first attempt to do the uh, combined EFT interpretation. And this will also be an important step toward the Atlas global EFT interpretation, you know, with the Higgs and the top. And this also probably allow us to also do the similar reinterpretations outside the Atlas collaboration. And we look forward to higher precision measurements and the new observations with the run three data. Okay, thank you very much for, for your attention. Any questions? Thank you, Junji. Obviously, we live in a very good time when all these uh, vector boson fusion processes are highlights of the of the program in Atlas and CMS. Uh, questions? If you go to slide number five, um, that's for the, 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 the tri-boson di, di, tri observation. Um, yes. So, no, five, yes. Maybe the, the previous it's one. It's hard the for me. Oh, yeah. yeah. Sorry. It's, it's okay. Because of the, the Zoom, I couldn't, uh, because I put it on uh, my up corner. And, uh, and uh, yeah, no. Right. So, this process, uh, as you mentioned, right, uh, it's a combination of the tri boson and cortege gauge boson um, diagrams and also the Higgs. But the Higgs is actually more than half of it. Uh, can you comment about? how these processes can be could be separable. So currently it was not possible, but with more data, uh, are we able to, would, would we be able to separate them or it's even not possible in round three, maybe at high luminosity like so that when we then do the electroweak fits that we can really directly probe the quart gauge boson and uh, triple yeah. gauge boson caplex in this production? Yeah, so that's a very good question. So, you know, for this analysis, as I mentioned that, uh, you know, we didn't really separate uh, this WH process from, from the others. So kind of the cost that we applied, you know, is a little bit more, you know, get rid of, you know, especially for the uh, two lepton channel, we, we get rid of a lot of WH process. So, you know, for the future, if we really wanted to, to measure this, you know, we probably also wanted to optimize the cut a little bit so that we can select a, a lot of events also from the WH process. Okay, so, so that is one thing I think we can, we can later improve. Uh, the second thing, of course, to really separate uh, the on-shell tri-W and the WH. So this one we, we need uh, to, you know, for example, to train in different uh, BDT variables, you know, to train it especially for on, on shell tri W production for the WH production. Uh, and then, you know, we can introduce two signal strains, for example, in our global feed to, to, to find this. Uh, I, I think it's, it's possible to do that, yeah in the future, but it is currently not done for this analysis. Do you think it will be possible with run two and run three, or we need more data for that? Um, I, you know, it depends. You can always try to separate uh, them. You know, I think you are mainly asking about uh, whether we can observe this process separately. Oh, yeah. yeah, that I, I haven't done this analysis yet. You know, as I said, uh, you know, we, we can try to also optimize the selection costs, you know, to get more WH events in, into the signal region. Currently, you know, we, we cut pretty high on the lepton PD and uh, one of the W is off shell from Higgs. You know, there are a lot of events has been thrown away, but uh, you know, uh, even, uh, this cost can be, be optimized later. Yeah, yeah, I think it is a possible, uh, you know, to do it for, for run three, yeah. Thank you. Okay, anyone else uh, has a question or comment? If not, then 
Thanks a lot, Junji, for this uh, wonderful talk. And uh, we move to our last part of the session, which will be given by Apana. Um, we, can, we can hear you. I don't see your slides yet. Uh, Apana. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, hi, hi. Uh, you share your slides. Yeah, I'm trying to. Uh, oh, I'm not able to share my screen. Uh, do I have the permission to share? I think you should you should have the permission to share. If you don't manage, I can share the slides for you if, if that's okay. Uh, yeah, just just give me one minute. I'll um, browser is preventing access to. Oh, sorry, uh, it is showing my browser is preventing access to uh, my share screen. Okay. Mm. Okay, let's um, let me try your slides and um, you can yeah, yeah, sure, go to sure. the next uh, uh, next page, right? So can people see the slide? Yeah. Okay, very good. So yes, I can see it. A partner will give us um, a summary of. Uh, Software uh, so uh, I uh, excuse me. I wanted to ask you one thing. So, are you using? Uh, I mean, did you use Safari to uh, download this PDF? Because there will be some problems. Uh, uh, I I downloaded the PDF. I'm sharing the PDF. So it looks it looks that it looks fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It looks fine. Yeah, it looks fine now. So let's get yeah. started. The floor is yeah, yours. sure. Sure. Thank you. So, uh, so uh, firstly, uh, I would like to thank the organizers for giving this opportunity to present my work. Uh, my work is on Nestor Soft Virtual Resum Trillion uh, Cross Section Beyond Leading Logarithm. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so let us start with a bit of uh, overview and background. Uh, the Drillian process, as we all know, it is one of the important processes at the colliders. And for precise measurements, one has a very clean environment uh, from the experimental side. And from the theoretical side, it is a very well understood process. And today, it's known to entry a low accuracy in QCD. Uh, here, the higher order perturbative QCD correction to this process provides ample opportunity to explore the structure of the perturbative series. Next slide. Uh, however, the reliability of a fixed order perturbative series uh, gets affected due to the presence of large logarithms at kinematic threshold region. Uh, so the resolution to this problem goes under the name threshold resummation through the seminal works of uh, people like Sterman, Katani, and Trendedu. And uh, today, the resummation is known to entry LL accuracy in literature. Next slide. Uh, yeah. So now let us, uh, let us see the theoretical framework to compute the inclusive cross section. As you can see here, the inclusive cross section sigma is. Uh, computed using partonic coefficient function delta, which is convoluted with the partonic flux phi. Here, the partonic coefficient function is a perturbative quantity. That means uh, we can calculate this quantity using Feynman diagrammatic approach, uh, order by order in perturbation theory, whereas the partonic flux is again a convolution of partonic distribution functions, which are non-perturbative in nature. Next slide. Uh, the 
the partoni coefficient function near threshold that means when the partoni scaling variable set tends to 1 takes this form so this is the perturbative structure of the coefficient function near uh, the threshold region so as you can see here the first two terms namely plus distribution and delta distribution they contribute to the soft virtual corrections and they are also known as leading power logarithms in the literature and these are the most singular terms in the limit set tends to one and this corrections uh, come only from diagonal channels and then we have log one minus set terms uh, these are nest to leading power logarithms and these are nest to dominant singular terms and uh, we call the corrections uh, coming from this kind of terms by nest to soft virtual correction and this kind of corrections can come from both diagonal and off diagonal channels and resummation of this term is known to LL accuracy. Uh, next slide. Uh, uh, the the problem of NSV or NLP has been of interest uh, for a long time and uh, you can see there are several dip different approaches, several different attempts in the literature to understand the structure of NSV as well as the resummation of NSV terms. Next term, uh, next slide, sorry. Uh, so recently the collinear factorization and renormalization group invariance approach has been implemented to study the NSV summation effects. And uh, following the same formal today's talk, I'll be talking about the nest to soft virtual uh, resum corrections to the drill and cross section beyond leading logarithmic accuracy. Next slide. In our approach, we, we considered the contributions coming from diagonal channels, only from diagonal channels. That means for the drill-in process, we considered the contributions coming from QQ bar channel. And the key points which we have uh, used to construct uh, our formalism, our collinear factorization and renormalization group invariance, and finally, the logarithmic structure or the transcendentality structure present in the higher order perturbative results. Next slide, please. Uh, so now let us see how the formalism has been constructed. For that, let us begin with uh, factoring out the pure virtual contributions which are uh, encapsulated in this uh, quantity called form factor, leaving behind a function SC which basically uh, embeds the soft plus nest to soft corrections coming from real emission configurations. And here the partonic coefficient, partonic cross section sigma hat is UV finite, but it has some residual infrared uh, divergences, which are initial state collinear singularities. Uh, so these singularities can be removed using the process of mass factorization through mass factorization kernels gamma or uh, which are also known as alterly palissy uh, kernels and uh, using this factorization formula we get a collinear finite partonic coefficient function which goes into our uh, uh, our formula for computing the hadronic uh, inclusive cross section next next slide uh, so here, uh, uh, inverting the mass factorization formula, we can write down the uh, uh, the formula for UV finite mass factorized partonic coefficient function for the diagonal channel. As you can see here, this is a decomposition formula in terms of certain building blocks, which are already introduced in the previous slide. And if you can study this building blocks in detail, we can compute this partonic coefficient function or we can understand the perturbative structure of this, uh, this quantity order by order in perturbation theory. So as you can see here, uh, these building blocks satisfy a set of governing differential equations. Uh, for instance, the form factor satisfies Sudakum K plus T differential equation and uh, the set UV, which is renormalization constant, satisfy the renormalization group equation. And we have uh, alternately palissy spreading corner, and they satisfy uh, the alternately palissy evolution equation. Next slide. 
uh, yeah. So this is the evolution equation, which is controlled by this elderly Padesi spreading function P. And near the threshold, the uh, the perturbative, the analytic structure of the spreading function looks like this. So you can see the first two terms contribute to soft virtual and next two terms contributes to nest to soft virtual. And, but after that, uh, the, the, the terms which are of order one minus z, they, their contribution start, uh, start from beyond NSV. So in our analysis, since we are interested only in the SV and NSV contributions coming from diagonal channels, we we neglect all those terms uh, which uh, which con contributes from beyond NSV onwards. So therefore, we need to consider only diagonal parts of the splitting functions uh, because the off-diagonal parts of splitting function contributes to beyond NSV. Next slide. Uh, now, using the finiteness of the Padoni coefficient function, also the Sudaku differential equation of form factor, it is possible to show that the soft plus nest to soft contribution uh, encapsulated in this function SC also satisfies the K plus C type of differential equation, uh, which looks like this. And here, all the IR singularities are embedded in the uh, in the quantity k bar and g bar uh, is ir finite and solution to this differential equation exhibits certain convoluted exponential behavior here the exponent phi c uh, is uh, is not a soft collinear function and this function basically uh, contains uh, the contributions coming from real virtual, real real configuration, etc. Because we have factored out all the pure virtual contributions. So, like this. Next slide. Slide. Uh, and the solution to this. Uh, uh, next slide. Yeah. The solution uh, of the soft collinear function uh, looks like this. And this solution is inspired from uh, explicit reason and it's been verified up to third order. As you can see here, it has a soft virtual piece SV, phi SV, and it also has a piece coming from NSV. And this phi SV, it is a function of a certain universal anomalous dimensions, namely cusp uh, A, uh, F soft anomalous di dimension, and some process dependent quantity denoted by g bar and then we have phi nsv and this is again a, a function of the universe and anomalous dimensions called collinear anomaly dimensions denoted by c and d and then a process dependent quantity phi c and both these pieces uh, they they should contain the right divergences in order to get cancelled the divergences uh, in form factor and the elderly parasy spreading kernels appropriately. And uh, one can uh, see how this kind of a solution uh, contribute to SV and NSV terms in the coefficient function by expanding this ansatz as shown here. So first ansatz, the expansion of first ansatz will contribute to SV terms and the second one uh, contributes to the nest uh, uh, soft virtual. Next slide. Yeah, so in this slide, I have just summarized whatever we have discussed so far. So using the knowledge of the all order factorization formula for coefficient function, along with the, uh, the Sudoku differential equation, uh, RG equation, etc., we propose uh, an all ordered exponential uh, formula for computing this uh, coefficient function and this exponent uh, uh, which looks uh, next slide yeah the exponent uh, has this form it is again a decomposition formula in terms of those building blocks introduced uh, earlier <clears throat> and this exponent contains only SV distributions and NSV logarithms next slide uh, yeah, so what do we achieve as a consequence to this uh, decomposition formula or uh, to this exponential structure? Well, uh, as you can see in this table, 
uh, we we get to predict certain SV and NSV logarithmic terms to all orders in perturbation theory using only the uh, lower order information. For instance, the log cube, log five, log seven, so on logarithms, a two loop, three loop, four loop, so on, can be predicted using the one loop information. And from uh, two loop information, we can predict the log four, log six, log eight, so on logarithms, a three loop, four loop, five loop, uh, so on. And uh, so in general, what is the range of our predictability? So in general, using s to the power uh, n minus one information, we can predict log to the power n plus one to log to the power two n minus one logarithms at order s to the power n. Next slide. Yeah, so uh, knowing the functional form of uh, each building blocks, we can derive the integral form, uh, the integral representation uh, for this uh, coefficient function. Uh, you can see it has two components, uh, C0, and C0 captures the delta contribution from form factor and soft collinear uh, distribution. Uh, whereas the exponent psi d, it has two pieces, and uh, the piece P, uh, P prime, it comes from the splitting uh, function, whereas this P is QC, uh, it, it is process dependent, it, is, uh, it, it comes from the finite contribution from soft collinear function SEC. Next slide. Yeah, so to perform the resummation, uh, we, we take the Mellin moment of this coefficient function. Uh, so the threshold limit set tends to one in a set space gets translated to n tends to infinity in n space. So in the limit n tends to infinity, taking into account both SV and NSV terms, we get uh, we get log n and log n by n terms in n space, and uh, we we uh, omit all those terms start order of one minus n square because those are those uh, contributions comes from beyond NSV. Next slide. Yeah, so in this slide, you can see the analytic form of this coefficient function in N space. So let us focus on the nest two soft virtual logarithmic terms, which are one by N suppressed as compared to the SV term. So you can see this tower of this NSV terms and each uh, each order, this AS log n becomes order one when AS is very small at every order one by n. So therefore, we need to resum this tower in order to get any reliable prediction. Next slide. Uh, yes. So so we uh, modified the existing resummation formula. Uh, by including the NSV logarithm, which are uh, basically embedded in this uh, exponent sin SV. So here, the C0, which C0, this n independent coefficient, and the psi NSV, exponent psi SV, is old result, already known since 1989. And we have uh, the psi NSV, which is a new result of our work, and uh, which is written down, which, which is written down in terms of certain resummation exponents g bar and h. Uh, they basically take into account the N NSV logarithms to all orders. In a slide. So uh, now let us see what is the impact of uh, of the NSV resummation. For that. Uh, let us start with the k factor analysis so as you can see in this slide uh, in this plot i mean uh, the resumed curves uh, denoted by the solid lines they lie above their uh, respective fixed order ones which are denoted by this dashed lines so this basically suggests that there is an enhancement due to the inclusion of the resumed corrections mm, one can also see that the resumed curves uh, they are closer to each other as compared to the fixed order curves. And uh, we can also see that the recent corrections decreases as we go uh, for higher logarithmic uh, 
accuracy. So, so from this plot, uh, we can conclude that the perturbative convergence the, in the reason result, in the reason predictions is improved. Uh, this basically leads to the reliability of the recent predictions. Next slide. Yeah, so now let us see what happens to these results under the variation of the unphysical scales, uh, namely uh, renormalization scale mu r and uh, factorization scale mu f. Uh, so that we have performed a seven point uh, scale variation of our results. Yeah, so in the right panel, from the right panel, you can see that the recent result show a systematic reduction in the uncertainty with the inclusion of each logarithmic corrections. Uh, however, if you compare the bands in this plot against the bands in the fixed order one, just uh, depicted in the left panel, you can see that there is an improvement at the NLO plus the uh, NLL bar, which is this light to blue band, than at the NNLO plus NNL bar, which is the dark blue. So, so to understand this behavior, also to understand the, uh, the scale uncertainty in a better way, let us analyze the effect of each scale individually on the reason result. So in the next, next slide, uh, yeah, so here uh, we analyze our result uh, under the under the variation of factorization scale mu f, uh, uh, keeping the mu r scale fixed at q. So here also you can see uh, that the NLO band gets improved with the inclusion of NLL bar, but the story is different at NNLO. Uh, uh, because NNLO band increases with the inclusion of NLL bar. So <clears throat> this is the same observation we have seen in the previous slide, which was for the seven point scale variation. So this basically tells us that the width of the seven point band of resum predictions mainly comes from the mu of uncertainty. So to understand this uh, behavior, why this is happening, Let's look at the percentage contribution of each pedonic channel separately. At NLO, you can see the contribution of QQ bar is 22%, whereas QG is minus 5%. And this clearly tells you that at NLO, QQ bar is the dominating channel. Uh, so if you sum up the collinear logarithms coming from the QQ bar, which is also the dominating channel at NLO, we see an improvement. But the scenario is different for NNLO. At NNLO, you can see the percentage contribution of QQ bar and QG are more or less comparable uh, in contrary to the NLO case. Therefore, there is a bigger cancellation between these two channels at NNO level. So, Recall that in our analysis, uh, we have only considered the contribution coming from diagonal channel, which is QQ bar channel. So the QG, the resummation effects from QG is missing in our analysis. So the missing QG channel uh, resumed contribution leads to more uncertainty at NNLO plus NNLL bar due to the comparable uh, contribution of QG with that of QQ bar. So we know that a mu f factorization scale is the scale which basically uh, mix, a, mix up a various pyrotonic channels under the DCLAP evolution. So therefore, it is very essential to keep all the contributing channel at particular order to, to see the improvement under the uh, variation of that scale. Uh, next slide. Yeah, one minute left. We should. Uh... Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Next slide uh, is the last one. So uh, here uh, we we analyze our result under the variation of renormalization scale, keeping the scale mu of fixed. So you can see that the highlight of this plot is that the uh, the error band of NNLO plus NNL bar uh, get, becomes substantially thinner. So why is this happening? So we know each pyrotonic channel is invariant under mu r variation. And therefore, uh, if you include more correction within a channel, the uncertainty is uh, expected to reduce. So finally, 
we, we can conclude that inclusion of risk umbrella reduces the renormalization scale uncertainty remarkably uh, as you can see in the figure as compared to the fixed order ones which is uh, depicted in the left panel uh, yeah next slide so uh, here i will summarize our main findings so in our uh, in our work we studied the nest soft virtual terms uh, in inclusive reaction using the concepts of uh, collinear factorization and rg invariance we have we have proposed an exponential form which basically allows for all order prediction for certain sp and nsv logarithms and we have also put forward a resummation framework to resum the nsv logarithms in n space next slide uh, from the phenomenological uh, an analysis we have seen that the inclusion of resum nsv terms improves the perturbative convergence uh, and reduces the uncertainty from the choice of a renormalization scale mirror however the absence of quark gluon initiated a qg initiated contribution to nsv part leaves large factorization scale dependence which basically indicates that it is important to take into account the resummation effects coming from qg channel as well uh, for the adrenaline process next slide so so uh, now there is a, a scope of modifying the existing formalism for incorporating the effects coming from off diagonal channels like uh, qg so yeah so with this uh, uh, i again uh, thank the organizer for this opportunity uh, yeah thank you many thanks for this uh, detailed talk Sloppy questions and uh, theory. I hope there are some questions uh, from uh, our theoretical friends if they are connected. I'm afraid I will not be able to actually uh, pose a relevant question. But can you just give us a context of the of your work? Because I mean, there are also. There have been other uh, works that did uh, N3 NLO plus NLL resumation, like this. It's called Drellian Turbo um, Generator or um, Library to calculate these effects. Can you just give us an um, overview of where your work actually exactly fits and uh, what is the most important yeah. contribution yeah. here? So yeah so the work actually comes under the category of resummation so so uh, i mean we know that uh, there are uh, there are formalisms and uh, uh, i mean methods to to uh, resum the leading uh, leading power logarithms uh, in the threshold expansion these are also known as soft version so uh, I mean, the resummation framework uh, for this soft virtual leading terms uh, in the threshold expansion has been known since very long, uh, uh, 1980s. But the nest to leading logarithms, which are nest to leading power logarithms, which are actually the sub leading logarithms in the threshold expansion, recently there are there have been studies which shows that those uh, logarithms are also as important i mean also important if not not if not more important than the leading one but they also have significant contribution so 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 it is important to read some the contributions coming from sub leading uh, sub leading uh, logarithms as well so in our work we have achieved a resummation framework to resum the uh, resum the terms which are subleading uh, in the threshold expansion. So, and uh, our phenomenological study shows that by including the the resum subleading terms, the perturbative convergence is improved, and also the scale dependency, uh, the especially the renormalization scale dependency of the result has been improved uh, by including this new. Uh, new uh, nsv resumed corrections i see thank you have you have you been able to compare to some data to to see how that performs um when compared to the measurements uh 
uh, no not yet i have not compared against the experimental data but uh, there there are uh, some uh, data from i mean the theory work only and uh, those are the accuracy of those work is only the leading logarithm but uh, our is uh, uh, we have achieved the accuracy till nest to nest to leading logarithm so till n ll our results are matching with the results in the literature but those are not from uh, not from measurements i see but uh, more consistent yeah. checks with uh, the other approaches that we use the yeah other approaches like a uh, soft collinear effective theory uh, yeah okay maybe in the meantime, someone had a question. No one thought about. Okay, so many thanks for your talk. And I want to thank yeah. all the speakers for excellent presentation, nicely prepared and also staying on time. So this actually brings us to the end of the session because the last talk was postponed. Um, so have a good rest of the day and see you in the evening for the neutrino uh, plenaries. So thanks again to all the speakers and bye-bye.